introduce the distinguished panelists first. Uh, Professor Vivian Schmidt, our own Jean, Profe Jean Monnet Professor of European Integration here at Boston University and also prof Professor of International Relations and Political Science here at BU. Uh, she is the founding director of the BU Center for the Study of Europe, um, which uh, has been a tremendous uh, addition to the offerings of this uh, university. Um, uh, one thing I always like to mention is that her book, Democracy in Europe, was named by the European Parliament in 2015, one of the 100 books on Europe to remember. Um, she has written many books. Her current work focuses on democratic legitimacy in Europe with a special focus on the challenges resulting from the Eurozone crisis and on methodological theory, in particular discursive institutionalism. Um, then, in the order of presentation, we have uh, Laszlo Andor, a Hungarian economist. Welcome. Uh, holder of a PhD in economics and um, associate professor. Uh, among many other roles, between 2010 and 2014, he was no less than Commissioner for Employment, Social Affairs and Inclusion in the Barroso II Commission. Real insider. Uh, since 2014, he has taught at the ULB uh, in Belgium, um, in, Br in Brussels. Uh, last but not least, Professor Mario Tello, uh, born in Cremona, Italy. Uh, he's a professor of history of political thought, and he teaches this discipline at the Lewis University, uh, Guido Carli, Rome. Uh, he uh, has been a visiting professor uh, just about everywhere, um, and uh, um, uh, he holds a Jean Monnet chair at Personam, also at the ULB in Brussels. Uh, among his books uh, in 2012, Globalization Europe and Multilateralism. Um, he is also a member of the Royal Academy of Sciences in Belgium. So with such distinguished panelists, I'll nonetheless be tough uh, enforcing 15 plus two uh, minutes for each presentation, uh, followed by, uh, I hope, ample time for discussion. Um, please, Vivian. I'm going to be talking about uh, questions of how you theorize democratic legitimacy in the Eurozone crisis. And I'm going to be talking about this because the Horizon 2020 project very much sort of starts from these questions of legitimacy and then takes them a lot farther. So I'm going to give you a sort of preliminary um, approach to how we think about the Eurozone crisis, issues of democracy and legitimacy. And I think we first have to ask about what's the problem with the Eurozone crisis? And that is that it's not just a problem of economics, which many people have written about at length, not just a question of politics, and we can see that in terms of the rise of populism, the rise of the extremes on the right and the left, in response to the economic problems. We know the economics in terms of uh, the threats of deflation, and even though the Eurozone seems to have destabilized, it's not growing, not nearly sufficiently quickly, uh, problems of high unemployment, et cetera. Problems even more significantly in Southern Europe. Um, so the question is not just how we think about the economics and the politics, but also what about legitimacy. And I've written before about uh, the problems of legitimacy, talking about the way in which Eurozone uh, institutional actors have responded is what I call governing by the rules and ruling by the numbers. Essentially that in response to the crisis, rather than saying we want deeper integration in terms of say mutualization of debt, euro bonds uh, and various other kinds of things that might have solved the problems, what you saw was a doubling down on the rules as a, with a reinforcement of the Stability and Growth Pact through various pacts and pacts, six pack, two pack, fiscal compact, etc. So the question becomes how, what, what happens next and what you see and what I'll argue is that um, in response to the problems, in response to the fact that governing by the rules and ruling by the numbers didn't, wasn't working, you saw EU institutional actors or EU actors generally um, beginning to reinterpret the rules. You saw incremental change. So the puzzle and my overall question is how have 
the EU institutional actor, actors managed to reinterpret the rules by bending, if not breaking, legally binding rules while retaining legitimacy through the Eurozone crisis. Uh, so a subset of questions with this is, how do EU institutional actors build legitimacy to reinterpret the rules? How and with whom do they coordinate in terms of other policy actors? And to whom do they communicate, generally the public, about the reinterpretations of the, book, of the rules to build and receive legitimation. Um, and how do they do this in, in the project we talk about, and that's Len Seabrook and Adelaide Singu's uh, set of ideas. How do, they, how, how do you think about change in, at the moments of fast burning crisis and slow burning? Fast burning would be 2010 to 2012 uh, when Everything looked like it was falling apart. 2012, July 2012, when Mario Draghi says, I'll do whatever it takes. Uh, that's when the slow burning phase of the crisis stops. Sorry, the fast burning phase of the crisis stops, but the slow burn begins. The slow burn begins because the problems aren't solved, but the markets have quit attacking in the way they had before, before and there was time to think. Uh, in, in, the, um, in the project, we've theorized that in fast burning, at the fast burning moment, it's much harder to come up with new ideas, that often you end up with the doubling down on the rules uh, and sort of interest-based quick solutions, uh, and that in the slow burning phase of the crisis, it's possible to find ways of digging yourself out, getting new ideas, et cetera. But then, in all of this, I haven't mentioned democratic legitimacy. So how do we think about, how do we conceptualize democratic legitimacy? And for this, I look to uh, the European Union studies literature and add uh, a little bit. In the European studies literature, um, people often talk about output versus input. Output policy effectiveness and performance. Uh, this is often the European Central Bank, the Commission, um, justify what they're doing on, is this, you know, is it effective, uh, uh, are the policies effective, um, is there proper economic performance? Um, but you, what you see is that in the output, in these output policies, you have a difference between technical and political kinds of legitimacy judgments. The technical, non-majoritarian actors, um, it's about how do you demonstrate your performance, your legitimacy in terms of performance and effectiveness. It's about technical, lo technical knowledge economic principles that you go to to demonstrate, uh, uh, to reinforce legitimacy. Um, on the political side, it's, it's ma for majoritarian institutions, is does this fit with elite ideas about interests and values? Um, what about, it's also about citizen perceptions, uh, and does it fit, does it resonate with citizens' values uh, and normative principles? So that's on the output side, how you judge legitimacy of policy performance. But the other side of this is input. Uh, input politics, so this is about participation, govern government responsiveness to the will of the people. Um, and here we have to distinguish between the European Union level and the national level. At the national level, uh, whereas we can talk about output policies and the traditional phrase of this is government for the people, uh, for input politics it's government, government by the people, perhaps of the people as well. So at the national level with by the people, it's <coughs> clearly participation. At the EU level, it's linked to European Union institutional actors, different sources of legitimacy, which we can go into later. But in any case, in the EU studies literature, uh, there's generally assumed that there's a trade-off between input and output. So uh, institutional actors provide good output, you know, the policies work, and even if the citizens haven't voted for it, it's fine. On the other side, for input, if the citizens voted for something really stupid uh, and it doesn't work, they still voted for it, 
bad output, good, but it's still legitimate. So trade-off between input and output. If I had a slide, you'd see it, but I don't. But there's a third concept, the sort of between. So here's input, citizens participate, there's output, and there's this black box of governance where we don't know what happens. But in that black box of governance are a whole range of other kinds of legitimizing mechanisms. Accountability, transparency, um, inclusiveness, accessibility, efficacy. These are all the words that EU institutional actors use the, all the time. But generally, no one's theorized, so what is this? So let's call it throughput. I've called it throughput. Input, output, and then in between, throughput. And throughput, unfortunately, doesn't work like input or output. There is no trade-off. If you have good throughput, meaning that institutional actors are accountable, transparent, accessible, inclusive, and their policies are efficacious, and the processes, sorry, are efficacious, this is all about the quality of the processes, if that's all good, it's invisible. No one cares. If it's bad, if it's oppressive, if it appears biased, if it appears corrupt, it may skew the input and taint the output. This is really important for the Eurozone crisis because the initial response, governing by the rules, ruling by the numbers, was really a process response. It was really a throughput response. And it was assumption, there was an assumption there that if you have good throughput, good quality processes, then the output, you'll have good performance, good output performance, and therefore it doesn't matter that the citizens aren't involved. Well, the problem is governing by the rules and ruling by the numbers did not work. It didn't necessarily provide, the throughput processes didn't necessarily provide good output, as we saw deteriorating uh, economics, uh, ultimately threats of deflation, increased unemployment, certainly in Southern Europe, um, et cetera, low growth, and that's the problem. It's that there was an assumption that there would be a trade-off throughput with input and output, no trade-off, so what do you do? And that's where what we've seen is the reinterpretation of the rules, but a reinterpretation of the rules by stealth. The problem for EU institutional actors, given an institutional system that is very difficult to manage, a unanimity rule that means that anyone uh, that for treaties, any one EU, any one member state can simply veto any solution. Uh, institutional rules that are that once they are they are made are very very difficult to reverse. All of this means that EU institutional actors are kind of trapped by the rules that they've created. So what do you do? You try to find whatever kind of discretionary authority or flexibility that you have, but you don't say it. So what I've also previously argued with the reinterpretation of the rules uh, is it's done by stealth. And what you see for the different institutional actors, and I'll describe this in, uh, discuss this very briefly in a minute, is that they say one thing and they do another. They say it's all about austerity and structural reform, and yet you get increasing flexibility. You see it in the European Council, where the Council keeps talking about its stability culture, that it's all about stability, and yet in 2012 they agree to growth. And in 2014, the discourse turns to flexibility. There is a discourse here. Uh, investment. But it's all saying that it's about stability. I suppose the best example of the reinterpretation of the rules by stealth, where the reinterpretation is basically in plain view, is the European Central Bank. The European Central Bank has reinterpreted uh, its mandate massively, radically. And yet it keeps saying we're doing everything within its mandate. It starts with Trichet in 2009 saying, oh, we cannot be a lender of last resort. This is all about credibility. And they do very, very little in terms of non-standard policies to Draghi, 
who increasingly reinterprets the rule, but each time says they move from, from credibility to stability in the medium term, and within that, then you can do more and more unorthodox policies, and thank goodness, and by now we're at quantitative easing. This is all fine, but it's that, this is the reinterpretation of the rules um, by stealth in the sense that it's a constant saying, it's not saying, look, the rules are wrong, the rules don't work, let's find it, let's get us a new charter that will make it work. Instead, it's, we're following the rules. This is all within our mandate, as that mandate is radically reinterpreted. Um, but the commission, but the council can, sorry, but the ECB can do this because it's got tremendous independence of authority. It's the most independent of, of, of central banks uh, that exists. Um, so that it has the authority and the independence to do it even though it actually needs, uh, Draghi needed to talk to Merkel to convince her, you know, et cetera. Uh, needed to isolate the Bundesbank in order to be able to do this. So it's, it, not as easy as all of that, but it has a large amount of autonomy. In contrast to the commission, the commission that has to, that also actually reinterpreted, in, reinterpreted the rules by stealth, but what the commission did consistently was, say, was deny that it was reinterpreting those rules. It kept saying, uh, Ollie Wren as commissioner kept saying, this is all about harsh austerity and structural reform, even as the commission gave increase, increasingly uh, gave derogations to the rules and created flexibility. Italy and, and France um, in 2013, Spain was allowed to re was allowed to provide the Commission with a new way of calculating um, the I think it was the structural deficit in order to be able to demonstrate a primary surplus so that etc. Um, but. So what you got was increasing flexibility with the denial. Well, why? I mean, so, so whereas, whereas the ECB hid its reinterpretation of the rules in plain view with a large communicative discourse to the public saying, and to other actors saying this was all legitimate, what you got on the side of the commission was, hey, we're, you know, we're not. Well, institutional context dictates that because in the institutional context, the uh, commission always had to worry about the council, where they go and agree, and it was certainly the Northern European coalition uh, that uh, made it very, very difficult. Um, also, how much discretion uh, is possible was also part of that. Um, what I have uh, talked about, just to uh, be um, amusing, uh, is to ask questions about is the European Central Bank the hero of the crisis or the ogre? Hero in terms of money to monetary policy as it goes from one size fits none policy, monetary policy to whatever it takes in July 2012 uh, and actually does save the euro or is it the ogre because of the austerity and structural reform that it pushed as a quid pro quo on member states as it saved the euro. Um, for the European Council, there are lots of people who talk about Germany in particular as a dictator in the Council for one size fits one rules, and you know the one I'm talking about. Um, uh, Germany's power of one, you know, there's not even the power of two, the Franco-German partnership. Um, on the other hand, you can call it a dictator, but maybe you want to call the council a deliberative political body. Because after all, Germany did agree, Merkel did agree to at least a discourse of growth in 2012, a discourse of flexibility in 2014, and investor, investment from Juncker. Um, later. And finally, and I'll be ending here, well, no, two. Uh, one minute. One minute. Uh, the commission, uh, and I loved calling them this to their face and they laughed, uh, are they ayatollahs of austerity? Especially given the harsh discourse of Ali Wren that made outside people in the public see the commission as the really as the bad guy, are they ayatollahs of austerity or actually ministers of moderation? Because after all, they were the ones who actually 
provided much, much more flexibility to the member states and responded to the needs, were very concerned about the output performance and therefore gave up on the throughput processes, really, in order to ensure that output performance would work. And thus, they are, in some ways, ministers of moderation. And finally, the parliament, and I'll stop here, and this is, of course, problems for input. It's not problems, only problems of input from the national level, but also at the EU level. The European Parliament, where is it? Is it merely a talking shop? It certainly was that at first. Or is it on its way to becoming an equal partner, to get beyond the no size at all that it had initially? Uh, still problems, and I think that's where, if we want to talk about where the problems of democratic legitimacy are for the EU right now, it is focused primarily on the input. And it's muddling its way through the throughput, trying to get to a better output, but the input, in particular at the national level, the rise of populism, remains a serious problem. And I'll stop there. Thank you. As a footnote, I will add that this is supposed to be a system based on the rule of law, where interpretation by stealth should be known as breach of the rules. But that's a longer story. We're going to talk about that. There is a court, after all. Um, that's, uh, that's we'll talk about problem. that. Um, so, Laszlo, please. Um, the last time I was in the US was in 2012. And, um, and that was exactly the time when the European Union, especially the Eurozone, was experiencing uh, this terrible uh, recession. The second recession, which America did not experience, uh, because in about 2011, uh, European and American economic growth decoupled. Uh, Europe went back into a recession, and, uh, and uh, uh, the US continued uh, a job rich recovery out of um, uh, the Great Recession of 2009. Um, from this point of view, 2012 uh, was not, uh, not a great experience for us, uh, who were members of the European Commission, working for the European institutions in general. And wherever we went, we were lectured that these stupid Europeans uh, don't know how to run the economy. Uh, uh, and of course, from the Americans, it's OK. Uh, but when we went to the G20, uh, you know, the Argentinians are there, the Australians are there, uh, Indonesia, China, all these people are there in the G20. And in 2011, and 12, and 13, they all just you know, lectured uh, the Europeans. Um, which was not fantastic. Um, and of course, um, uh, from, from a distance in terms of geography and in time, um, everything uh, can be judged uh, better. And, um, and that's why I think it's very good that um, now uh, from Boston, uh, we can have a look at these European developments of the recent years. Um, but that was not my first time in the US. Um, in 1997, 98, um, I was actually teaching uh, in New Jersey uh, with a Fulbright uh, scholarship. And I made it up to Boston um, also. And of course, at that time, we didn't have the slightest idea of what was happening in the Catholic Church um, in Boston and, 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 and in this area. Um, but I also went down to Washington, um, where at the American University, there was an excellent uh, seminar on European monetary integration, um, where it was absolutely clear for me that uh, economists in the US do not believe in monetary union uh, in Europe. Uh, quite the contrary, uh, American economists, and especially those who were also advising the administration in Washington, they were preparing for the collapse. Because they saw that what was on paper cannot function in practice. It would be a miracle if it, if it did. And they didn't believe in miracles, at least those 
um, I, I met uh, at the American uh, uh, University. So some of them were even preparing for a, a future need for another Marshall Plan, because Europe is going to make such a big mess um, out of this Maastricht thing uh, that sooner or later uh, this, will, uh, this will be inevitable. So it's better to prepare uh, 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 for it. And uh, as you know, the, the junior minister in the administration at that time who was responsible for the international affairs was called Timothy Geithner. Um, and uh, when he was um, the Secretary of the Treasury, obviously he was very, very prepared for uh, the global financial crisis and especially uh, the European one. So it's, um, it's very good that um, the US um, directly um, and also indirectly through institutions like the IMF um, intervened uh, very constructively in the recent years, uh, stimulating um, uh, uh, a further development, a deepening of, uh, of the monetary union, because uh, uh, the halfway solutions of, uh, of the Maastricht architecture, that we want uh, a kind of integrated uh, market, but not without the safety nets. Um, we want uh, a complete freedom, but not without the infrastructure that would um, uh, provide a crisis response capacity. Um, so this halfway house obviously was not um, a durable one, not something uh, for, for, a, for, for a very long term. Uh, nobody knew at the time of the creation that it would take such a deep crisis, such a complex crisis, uh, to, 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 to bring about the message and even in such a deep crisis, not uh, everybody would understand uh, what the problem was and, and how to move uh, forward. Uh, in 2012, when, uh, when Europe was criticized, obviously austerity was already in the focus. And um, indeed, um, this has become a, a dominant theme of, of criticism, um, understandably, but without a proper definition of what exactly austerity is. Whether it is an input um, or an output, whether it is an outcome of a variety of circumstances and policies that the economy starts shrinking instead of growing, or whether there is a kind of philosophy of um, austerity, so it would be more an attitude or a doctrine uh, rather than uh, the outcome. Uh, probably, to some extent, uh, we would find elements of the reality on both sides. Austerity is definitely an outcome in terms of uh, in terms of uh, 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 arriving to a recession instead of the growth uh, uh, through a combination of fiscal, monetary, and other. Uh, uh, policies, um, but I think it also can be found at the side of the input um, to the extent that um, in the period 2012, 11, and even 12, um, a lot of elections in Europe were won by political parties which were advocating, so to speak, responsibility. Uh, responsibility uh, being the code name for all the policies to limit debt, to limit deficit, to stop uh, profligacy, uh, and, and, and practically selling uh, in a smart way uh, the policies which prioritize short-term stability as compared to uh, uh, sustainable and inclusive uh, economic uh, uh, growth. Uh, but as I said, uh, there, there is very little uh, what would be a kind of a exact definition of austerity. Um, the, the only source I found was a kind of a dictionary of the Financial Times, which tries to define uh, austerity in a way that um, in times of adversity, uh, you know, government cuts expenditure, especially wages, and then um, uh, it has a, 
it has a consequence in terms of the sacrifice of the real economy. Um, uh, in other words, and to, to put it very shortly, uh, the FT defines austerity as pro-cyclical fiscal consolidation. That even if you are at a time of adversity, right, so you are in a crisis, uh, or in an economic downturn, uh, you, you implement uh, fiscal consolidation instead of a fiscal stimulus. That's probably uh, austerity. Um, I, 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 I would obviously agree that pro-cyclical fiscal consolidation is wrong. <coughs> the problem with this definition, uh, on the one hand, is that it is too narrow, and on the other hand, that it is too, uh, too, uh, too narrow, uh, but differently. Too narrow because, uh, because it exempts monetary policy. It exempts monetary policy. You can't simply blame the fiscal policy for, for, for the austerity outcome. Um, in Europe specifically, the fact that the European Central Bank starts to increase uh, the interest rates in 2010 and 2011 um, is already contributing uh, to the recession. So it's not only Wolfgang Schäuble or Uli Rehn, um, it's also Trichet. Uh, Trichet marginally uh, deviated from uh, the orthodoxy of the ECB, uh, but in reality he didn't. He didn't. And he also drove Europe into the second recession. Uh, secondly, the problem is not simply that Europe cannot recover from the Great Recession uh, because of a kind of austerity philosophy uh, and, um, and uh, whether it is fiscal or monetary. The problem is that the, the overall architecture of Maastricht uh, is biased for consolidation as opposed to growth. Uh, so we are not simply speaking about the fact that the U.S. recovered from the great crisis faster than Europe and in a more sustainable way. The point is that if you look at the last 25 years, uh, for more than 80% of the time, the U.S. was growing faster than Europe. Uh, and, and, and this very strong bias of uh, of uh, the Maastricht architecture towards stability as opposed to growth, um, in my view, has a major responsibility uh, in, uh, in, in, in this. If you compare what instruments are linked to the two objectives, stability on the one hand and growth on the other hand, stability has all uh, uh, the legal backing, um, a lot of uh, enforcement mechanisms, uh, potentially sanctions, uh, growth, on the other hand, has a huge amount of recommendations, an open method of coordination, uh, which encourages countries to be innovative and invest in human capital, uh, which of course is great, um, uh, but much weaker as an implementation uh, uh, instrument or mechanism than uh, the power of uh, the EDP, which has been also more recently reinforced through uh, the so-called fiscal compact and related uh, regulations. So it's, it was not at all a surprise that in 2012, uh, the last year when I visited the US, um, and when the European Union actually received the Nobel Prize for Peace, um, the European trade unions gave another Nobel Prize uh, to the Commission, which was a Nobel Prize for austerity. Um, and. Uh, of course, it was not a um, not an enormous pleasure because uh, unemployment was uh, going to uh, a, a very high level at the time, um, 11 percent uh, in the European Union, 28 countries then, and 12 percent in the eurozone, which also made clear that the eurozone um, has a greater problem than the EU in general. Um, um, EU countries outside the eurozone whether we speak about the UK, or Sweden, Poland, or Hungary, as a matter of fact, um, had an easier situation than those inside uh, the Eurozone. So the problem was more linked to the concrete uh, functioning of the, of the Euro, as opposed to the European Union policies uh, in, 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 in general. Um, now, um, coming to towards um, a, a kind of conclusion. Um, the conclusion is that um, very often the criticism of uh, uh, the, the, the Eurozone crisis, the crisis response, 
austerity um, and related issues is looking at the possibility to rebalance the economic policy with social policies and then we always look into how in procedures but also in throughput policy efforts um, uh, we can produce a, a, a more balanced situation. I think this is important and obviously I would be the last one to disagree uh, with, um, with, with, with this approach. However, I think um, we have to uh, ask a second question as well, not simply about the balance of, the, let's say, more social uh, uh, policies and the economic one, but the nature and the content of the economic ones. So the point is not simply that the economic policies are working for the economy and they are not counterbalanced by social. The problem is that we have a wrong uh, economic uh, 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 policy content. And uh, uh, within the economic policies, we do not have uh, 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 the right uh, 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 framework which would allow uh, for uh, dealing with two major challenges of the European Union uh, structures, one of them uh, being the asymmetries, the fact that the Europe is very diverse, the Eurozone is very diverse, and if, you're, if your uh, monetary structures are too rigid, then you just turn the diversity into divergence instead of uh, uh, some kind of uh, harmony. And of course, the other one is the question of the cyclicality. Because if you, do, if you have uniform rules, uh, which you define irrespective of the business cycle, irrespective of the ups and downs, um, uh, obviously the uniform rules easily become pro-cyclical, whether you are aware or whether you are not aware uh, of this. There are some small margins to deal with either uh, the asymmetries or with the cyclicality in the existing rules, but um, as um, we have seen in the recent years, these margins, even if you try to bend it, are uh, insufficient. So that's why at some point uh, of the discussion, obviously it has to shift from uh, the question of governance, how you try to control a process, towards the system. What kind of model of the economic and monetary union uh, you try to uh, you try to uh, make functional in this very diverse uh, European uh, Union. Now, that means that somehow uh, the, the, the Maastricht framework would need to be revisited. It would need to be uh, repaired or reformed. This bias for the consultation, which always leads to a sacrifice in real economy and employment, and would need to be uh, uh, revised or changed. To what extent and how urgently it requires a treaty change is, a, is up to the discussion. At some point, of course, it will. But uh, many of us would say that it, a lot can still be done without a treaty change, uh, simply through a more complex analysis and by taking the Eurozone as a macroeconomic. This is just one of the, uh, the, the, the intellectual failures which we witnessed very close in the recent years, what economists would call the fallacy of the composition. That, for example, uh, a, a so-called austerity policy can work in a relatively small and econ open economy, but if you apply it in a number of economies, um, simultaneously, obviously, it can drag down the system. In other words, to understand that Italy is not Latvia um, um, was not so obvious for many people, and the EU, uh, which we have now, is just too polarized, uh, just too vulnerable as a result, and potentially facing uh, the next economic downturn without uh, the monetary system being repaired and prepared for it. Thank you. Thank you so much. A quick point of connection between the two presentations. When I hear that the IMF uh, had a constructive role in the whole story, I think of what Vivian said. said. I mean, one, one of the, uh, the, you said US? The, also the, IMF. the IMF, right? So mm -hmm. one um, virtue that the IMF had was that it was not tied by the rules of the treaty. So whatever could not be done by the treaty could be sort of outsourced to the IMF for a long time. That was part of the 
of the story. Um, uh, I must be, I must be uh, older than Laszlo because I remember already in 1992 all the Harvard economists had said that the euro was a crazy idea because of its inability to take into account asymmetric shocks. This was on The Economist in 1992. I remember that vividly, so definitely. Um, Professor Mario Tello, thank you so much. Take it away. So, uh, but I would like to take one of my minutes to say uh, how we are, uh, I think I can talk on behalf of the old European participants, particularly the director here, President Ramona, and the colleagues of the Institute of European Studies in Brussels, how we are happy for this uh, opportunity you are providing us to continue with this transatlantic dialogue, uh, research on European Union, our institute uh, is doing it since uh, 50 years and increasingly in cooperation with uh, institutes abroad, the, the cooperation with your center of excellence <coughs> the, and the, the distinctive audience here present today is particularly a priority for us. Well, even if we don't bring always good news from Europe, uh, particularly in the recent times, uh, and I would like also to uh, thank uh, uh, the project Enlighten, Enlighten for making it possible, particularly Vivian Schmidt and Seabrook. Well, uh, we are in a, the title is uh, Are Our Times the Mother for Invention? Yes, we, we, are, uh, uh, we are admiring your resilience in uh, focusing on European Union studies, and we are still convinced, I think is a shared persuasion, that the European Union is uh, still a laboratory for international cooperation and democratization at international level. That is the, the reason why I think uh, what we need is particularly to, to converge about a new research agenda, taking into account the challenges set by these uh, this uh, unexpected and very long uh, crisis. Uh, I think uh, that I will try to say that this crisis can only be addressed by a global uh, agenda and also a comparative agenda between Europe and United States, as uh, you did. And my thesis I anticipate here will be that maybe I have not a solution, but maybe the only possible wise solution is to strengthen the hard core of the European Union by providing it with a distinctive budget and a distinctive parliament. That will be the guideline of my uh, contribution. And uh, I would like to start saying that uh, uh, by addressing the political stakes in this uh, crisis, we have never to forget that both United States and Europe are uh, coping with three common challenges. And uh, we will focus on the, two, uh, the second and the third one today and tomorrow, but uh, we should keep in mind always the first one. The first one is that in this uh, post-hegemonic global disorder, uh, marked by a multipolar uh, power structure, and a very, a very, uh, let me say, uh, complex uh, global governance, we are uh, facing uh, new threats coming from uh, Russian power politics uh, and uh, from Islamic terrorism and other uh, new threats which all interplay in a negative way with the European Eurozone crisis. And that, uh, we are, always to keep in mind that Europe is not an island, but is uh, tremendously affected by this international relations dimension, instability. Uh, even the United States, but Europe in particular, is uh, a non-state actor. S uh, the, 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 the two more uh, challenges we are focusing on are on the one hand, the enduring global financial and economic uncertainties. Uh, almost 10 years after the beginning of the crisis, the crisis is not over. And uh, the BRICS are much more affected than someone pretended two, three years ago, uh, China included, Brazil in particular, but also Russia and India. 
and uh, you, the United States and European Union growth are not satisfying as uh, hoped, uh, and uh, the, the growth rate are uh, still quite low, as uh, Laszlo said. Both the European Central Bank and the Fed presidents have uh, decided to continue by a low interest policy that is very relevant for uh, the worries about the possible uh, evolution of the international economic context. And the third challenge we share is that uh, the social consequence of the crisis and the unemployment remembered by, by Laszlo and others are deepening the domestic troubles of Western liberal democracies on both sides of the Atlantic, producing new phenomena which are uh, defined in a very vague way as populist, but they are, in my opinion, they have a political meaning which should not be misunderstood, and which I call an authoritarian temptation. Authoritarian temptation expressed by various leaders and various uh, political movements on both sides of the Atlantic, including in the United States. Uh, well, the United States has, uh, have much more resources to address and to cope with these challenges. Because uh, they are a federal state, whereas the European Union is a regional uh, association of states and, uh, and the neighboring society, which are quite different from each other, and uh, uh, is not a state in the making. The consequences are that the United States administration disposes of a federal budget of 20% of the GDP for coping with the crisis, whereas the European Union only disposes of 1% of the GDP uh, central budget. The US dollar is still uh, a second, uh, the first reserve currency is able to attract uh, capital from uh, uh, abroad which makes the, the public debt in the United States less dramatic, less concerning than in Europe, even if it's 104% one, of the GDP. Uh, in, in Italy, it's 135% of the GDP, but it's particularly concerning given the context. And finally, in, in, as the political uh, challenge is concerned, the, the United States federal democracy uh, is also knowing hard times and polarization as never before since uh, several years, and particularly this year. However, the United States benefits to our eyes, external eyes, of the extraordinary decentralized at state level and centralized way of channeling populist and uh, and. Uh, and anti-democratic tendencies by the primaries, uh, by the Congress uh, election, which looks much more able of the European system to cope with the authoritarian temptation, which is very spread up in, the Europe, in many European countries. So this is, the, keep in mind that this difference in coping with the challenges is uh, crucial to my mind. Well, Europe is uh, uh, coping with, trying to cope since uh, f six years with this financial crisis uh, simultaneously with uh, four more crises. The uh, democratic legitimacy crisis, very well illustrat illustrated here by Vivian, but also the uh, disintegration, polity disintegration crisis, which is very well symbolized by the Brexit referendum next June, and by other secessionist movement uh, emerging in different countries like Spain and uh, Belgium and so on. Then uh, the refugees emergency is particularly dramatic and aggravating the problem of Europe by conceiving itself as a immigration country. And finally, the instability of the, at the eastern and and the southern border is aggravated by the vague of Islamic terrorism, which is uh, provoking a lot of implications as the 
immigration policy and also the democratic deficit are concerned. We, we cannot forget this interaction between these five crises. You know, the, if we look to understand the, the European evolution in this period. I totally agree with Vivian about the evaluation of the Draghi and the European leadership uh, policy in this context. Uh, but we should keep in mind that in the last uh, uh, report by Draghi last week, he expressed his worries, worries about the fragility of the Eurozone in this moment, in spite of 1.5% growth, to uh, ability to, to cope with an, a new external shock which could come. And if we read this worried report by Draghi, simultaneous with the report by the International Regulation Bank, a kind of bank of the central banks, they, even the optimist, uh, of the so-called optimist by Draghi, by his quantitative easing policy, is quite temperated by preoccupation about a possible global clash, new global cash, clash due, due to the, to the re growing international debt. Uh, the, the debt is growing up to 200% of the global GDP. The BRICS are particularly affected, and uh, this uh, is uh, one of the factors which make our, uh, should make our evaluation of the European uh, economic policy and debt policy particularly prudent. What is doing uh, uh, the European Central Bank? With the support of the Ang of Angela Merkel, as uh, Vivian said, I think no one in this room can believe that the quantitative easing policy started one year ago would have been possible against the, the general, German leadership. My thesis is that Germany, the German leadership is divided between uh, uh, Schäuble and Merkel, between the Bundesbank leadership and the other circles supporting the, the uh, European Central Bank. However, I would like to emphasize that the famous sentence, whatever it takes for saving the euro, repeated last week, by Draghi, would that be impossible without the European Council occurring two weeks before, in uh, the 29th of June 2011. So uh, this kind of uh, uh, support of Merkel to the Draghi uh, expansion policy should be explained because uh, uh, is uh, quite new in the German context, which is much conflictual. Uh, within the German leadership, it deserves research. We have some researchers in this room working on that. It's particularly relevant to understand. Uh, the first thing I have to say is that it would be a mistake to confuse the German economic policy and the, and the leadership supporting Draghi with uh, the austerity policy by, uh, with a neoliberal background. Uh, a research, I mentioned for instance, Dyson and others, have proved way, quite clearly that uh, since the very beginning, the uh, ordo liberal school was uh, uh, started with a break with the Austrian school of uh, von Mises and von Hayek and uh, took distance from this neoliberal school. Ordo liberalism is a kind of a organization of the market by social and political constraints is, a, is an alternative to the neoliberal school. It's much more complex and should be understood in a more uh, careful way. And uh, this uh, explains probably the policy mix which is the message and the, the input of Germany to the European economic policy. Uh, there is, is there an alternative? The alternative which has been proposed by several scholars is the, the coming back to the Keynesian national policy, Wolfgang Streich and others. Well, 
this, uh, uh, this uh, makes a kind of parallel between the current crisis and the crisis of the 30s, which is, uh, in spite of similarities, uh, not, not appropriated. Uh, the, the crisis of the 30s was clearly an underconsumption, an overproduction crisis, and Keynesian policies were particularly fit to cope with this at national level, cope with, the, with this underconsumption uh, crisis. Whereas our crisis now is fundamentally different in, the, in its cause, as I said and others said before. Second, uh, the Keynesian pure quantitative policies have been already criticized since the 30s by the Nobel Prize awarded uh, Gunnar Myrdal for being too let's say, blind and uh, not be qualified enough in terms of the quality of the public expenses. There are public expenses which are good, and public expenses which are bad. Uh, after accumulation of 30 or 40 years of public debt in many southern European countries, we have to emphasize this distinction. Not every deficit spending is good. It depends where and uh, which, how is the, it is qualified in terms of, for instance, research and so on, uh, or innovation policy, or uh, the agenda EU 2020, which has been forgotten for several years, but has to come back in the center of the European growth policy the famous Lisbon Agenda, or which is, uh, well, is uh, purely a deficit spending policy. Sometimes we have the feeling that some, uh, we could have uh, several jokes, uh, starting with our direct experience in many countries of Europe, Southern Europe in particular, how, no, how disqualified is uh, the public expenses. Uh, if you look at the uh, public debt in many countries, uh, from Greece to Portugal, uh, from Italy and Southern Italy in particular, we discovered yesterday that Rome city has 25 billion debt, and no, no government is able to cope with this challenge because the idea is that it's always possible to cope with this challenge by European money. But that is a, a that we should never forget uh, how the rhetorics of our Southern European countries, where I come from, is uh, very often a pure rhetoric in defense of uh, the incapacity of uh, national governments to cope with all the national problems, all the national difficulties of, uh, of addressing uh, the, the public debt. That is very important because uh, this uh, will be a justification for a very prudent assessment of the current European policy mix, which is proposed by, by Draghi and Merkel together. Uh, Merkel makes the, is the victim of, uh, of a different uh, evaluation. Sometimes is the holy Angela, or the, the mother Angela, in the case of the refugee crisis, sometimes is presented as kind of Dracula, or dictator of Europe. But uh, maybe we, we should look better beyond the discourse to what is really possible in the European context of now. Uh, and the, for the other European countries within the Council uh, and within the European Council, the question is how to address uh, the German leadership. Uh, by isolating Germany or by looking for a, an evolution of the German leadership towards an explicit provision of uh, European public goods. I think the support of Germany to the quantitative easing is a public good. Or uh, the, the willkommen culture in terms of refugee policy is a public good, which should foster and support Germany in this direction or uh, better isolate Germany. That is a question addressed even by the famous German intellectual Jürgen Koch in the last issue of Neue Gesellschaft. Well, uh, just I come to the, to the conclusion by addressing the, the two questions which are uh, the center, what economic policy and, uh, and uh, democratization of the Eurozone. Uh, I, and I, I try to follow the advice of, uh, of Vivian to make modest, modest uh, proposals for uh, a, a very qualified audience. 
Well, uh, I would like to focus, uh, since two minutes are not, uh, not many, only on the, on the particular uh, context of the, of the democratization and the defi democratic deficit. Uh, what is happening is that in many countries we are witnessing a, a let me say, a, a step back after the three democratization waves described by Huntington. Freedom House report uh, and the comments of by Larry Diamond are very clear in saying that 105 countries out of 195 in the world are stepping back in terms of democracy and freedom. Where in Europe we have something like that. Uh, we have a, lo a lot of uh, movements and parties and leaders openly playing the card of uh, uh, Euroscepticism, hat against the refugees and migrants, and uh, on the same time, they like very much and might very much one example, uh, Putin, Vladimir Putin. That is a, a shared admiration which makes problems for political science because of the different context, from Viktor Orban to some Polish leader, to Marine Le Pen, the Italian Salvini, the extreme groups in many countries, uh, other ultranationalist demagogues are really uh, presenting a, a picture where the manipulation of fears can go very, very far and uh, addresses the question whether the leadership by Merkel and Draghi will fall eventually because of, uh, of, of uh, demands of further democratization or because of uh, right-wing demands for authoritarian regime and nationalistic and protectionistic regimes. This question, uh, in my opinion, I conclude by that, fosters new proposals for democratizing the Eurozone, the policy mix and the strengthening of the Eurozone should be accompanied by a new proposal for uh, Aber, what Habermas calls a process of democratization of the Eurozone. I conclude by three points, four points, uh, very telegraphic. Number one, we have uh, uh, among the new reforms of economic governance, the European semester is particularly crucial. It's the uh, multilateral uh, monitoring of the national budgetary policies. Well, is a kind of centralization, no doubt about that. This should be accompanied by the, after the European Parliament paper of two weeks ago, elaborated by one member of our institute, Maria Rodriguez, by a strengthening of the role of the European Parliament, not after the, the monitoring by the Council, but before. That is crucial. This change would be crucial for uh, for uh, enhancing the democratization of the Eurozone and giving the feeling of a participation in the decision making about a crucial feature, a crucial tool of the economic governance. Second, the role of national parliaments. Contrary to the idea of Cameron, to use the national parliament as a kind of veto players in the European uh, decision making system, uh, and the idea which has been discussed by the European Convention, I was there in 2003, of creating a kind of assembly of national parliaments once a year, a kind of conference of national parliament discussing one issue a year, a central issue on the agenda, could maybe enhance the positive input participation, throughput participation of the European parliaments and their coordination in the European making uh, process, but uh, in a positive way. Third, uh, the distinct uh, budget for the, the European, uh, the Eurozone, proposed by Van Rompuy three years ago, should be uh, realized and accompanied by a distinctive European Parliament for the Eurozone, because it is absurd to give the, to the countries external to the Eurozone the power to stop crucial decision in terms of democratization of the Eurozone. Finally, 
the role of parties and associations should be strengthened, as uh, Philip Schmitter suggested recently. This, uh, uh, all of what I say is part of a vision which uh, has it at the center the idea of concentric circle. Uh, whatever the result, the outcome of the uh, British referendum of June will be, we should take this opportunity to make clear the distinction of role between the hardcore, which wants to go ahead in the European integration and cooperation, and the others, which have rights, obligations, and also the, let me say, accept not to put their nose in matters which affect the hardcore of European integration. This uh, tendency of, uh, of uh, reorganization of the polity, of the architecture, institutional architecture, in fact, of the European Union, in our comparative research is uh, something which uh, can be also discussed with Asian and Latin Americans, because even there, the regional architecture is about to be restructured in terms of concentric circles. Thank you very much for your attention. I, I wonder about, about some of the things I, I've heard. First, uh, directed to uh, Vivian and Mario, um, you appear to suggest that the ECB followed the rules uh, exactly, perhaps subject to some reinterpretation. Uh, uh, you appear to suggest that uh, that is a wonderful thing that we have uh, the ECB uh, uh, in coordination with the German government doing things that are really saving Europe. And I wonder about this interpretation because there could be another interpretation that uh, the ECB actually violated the treaty uh, in, a, in a major way. Number one, uh, the primary mandate of the ECB according to the treaty is price stability. They define that to be close to 2%. They have not delivered on that. I mean, it's, it's very clear that policy has been inappropriately tight in the last several years. And if it's one thing I would want the ECB to do is deliver on the primary objective. The, the other element, I think that the, the fact that there is the reference that uh, there was the need to have some agreement in the EU Council of June 2012 in order to have the famous response by the, uh, by the ECB on whatever it takes and so forth, that actually take it to be a major, major problem. So I thought the ECB was supposed to be independent of the government, just do the right thing, regardless of what the governments are doing. So I, I wonder about the inconsistency of uh, somehow praising the ECB, whereas the, the arguments you use seem to suggest major violations of the treaty. Uh, to, uh, uh, to Laszlo, uh, a, a couple of things on, um, um, uh, on, on, on economics. Uh, uh, first of all, I'm not sure your, your description of the comparison of GDP between the U.S. and, uh, and the euro area is, uh, is fair. It's true the U.S. has been growing most of the time faster than the euro area, but this is because population uh, is, is growing faster. If one looks at per capita GDP, uh, growth has been really similar in the euro area and the, uh, and the U.S., except since 2011. Really, this is the last uh, five years that are, that are exceptional on, on this one. But on austerity, uh, the, uh, the question is, do we really want to include monetary policy as part of the definition of, uh, of austerity? Uh, I, 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 don't, I don't think that would be appropriate because austerity is, is a choice for fiscal policy. No. And, and again, um, you know, maybe I want to be too strict about this, but my reading of the treaty is that we want the ECB to be doing just monetary policy, focus on that, with taking into account what fiscal policy is doing, but not really meddle with fiscal policy. That's not the same. That's well, uh, let's, let's, let me take another, another question and maybe another couple of questions so, so then we can, you guys take yeah. notes, okay, don't forget. Thanks. It was, uh, uh, so it's okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so the first question to the... Introduce audience. yourself. Uh, sorry, Daniela Gabor. Daniela Gabor. Oh, they're recording it. Okay, Daniela Gabor, UE Bristol. Uh, it was striking to me, and I have a question for all the panelists, that uh, we have discussed the European crisis for what, an hour and 20 minutes, and we had, haven't said the word finance once, and I'm surprised why the financial sector is not important as an actor in, in your account of the crisis or, or what's coming next. 
uh, Matthias asked me to say shadow banking, so I'm going to say shadow banking. Uh, but in general, if, I, if we're thinking, for example, for, uh, about the European Commission's uh, proposals for a financial transactions tax, that could have provided the European budget that uh, could have met many uh, demands that are uh, happening now in Europe, but it was the, the ECB together with the financial sector that opposed the European Commission and the, the member states' uh, uh, proposals for that. That's the first one. The second one to, to Professor Andor. Uh, in Europe, when we hear the European Commission, the IMF and the ECB in the same sentence, we all think Troika. So I was a bit uh, surprised when you, say, you, you mentioned the positive contribution that the IMF has made in, in Europe. And I was wondering what do you have in mind in, in, when you say that? Thank you. Anybody else, or should we start with... Oh, okay, yes, please. Thank you very much. Ramona Coman, uh, the Institute for European Studies. My question is addressed to the three members of the panel, and it is about flexibility and the reinterpretation of the rules, and about the Stability and Growth Pact, uh, which has been revised several times in 2005, when the, commission's five, when the Commission said that the aim is to help member states not to sanction them, and then in 2011 and 2013 with the two-pack and six-pack, again where the, the aim was to strengthen <coughs> the rules, and now in 2015, so the last year, the Commission published this new communication about the best use of flexibility within the existing rule of the Stability and Growth Pact, so my question is, how do we explain this, this interplay between strengthening the rules, flexibility, from a political science point of view or from the economist point of view? And the question is, who decides when to introduce flexibility and when to strengthen the rules? Thank you. A 30 seconds question, and then we move to the answers, the first round of answers. Thank you very much, uh, Mat Matthias, Matthias, Johns Hopkins, Seiss. I wanted to know if the panelists could comment. Uh, silence, please. I, I wonder if the panelists could comment on uh, Wolfgang Schäuble's latest comments that the ECB's monetary policies have created populist movements, including the AFD in Germany, and also his last effort of, of getting the G20 to um, have a joint effort at getting central banks to raise interest rates, while at the same time stressing that it's really important that they're politically independent. Thank you. Okay, so let's... Uh, um, okay, so the very last question. Uh, Christoph Nijdam, Finance Watch. Um, yeah, I wanted uh, to know how you would call the reinterpretation by the Commission of the following narrative. I've heard that in their interpretation of the ACB rules could be uh, taken as a breach of the treaties. So what about the following at the EC level? At the EC level, uh, under the previous commissions, the narrative was financial stability is a prerequisite for growth and jobs. We have kept exactly the same word, but we have inverted the order. And with the new uh, commission, uh, it has become growth and jobs are prerequisite for financial stability. How would you qualify that? Thank you. Vivian. So, um, yeah. Um, I'll start with a, a response to the um, commission reinterpretation. The, What's I think very important to note is that 2011 to 2014 is really reinterpretation of the rules by stealth. Beginning in 2015 with the Juncker Commission, we see a shift, sort of a recognition that they have an, a, engaged in flexibility. Problematically, they then say, we're gonna now have rules for flexibility. So here we go again with uh, it's all about processes. Um, but what's significant is in the annual growth survey, you do see a, you do see a shift. Uh, whereas 2011 to 2014, fiscal consolidation comes first. Number two is structural reform. Number three is, oh, well, we might as well talk about growth and jobs and um, poverty and inequality. Uh, and you see increasingly over time that that, that that structural reform itself also changes from crush the unions in 2011 to in 2014, talk to the, uh, talk to the labor unions, unions and do anything you can to promote social concertation. So you see a slow shift in what the rules mean, but 
fiscal consolidation re re remains number one, which means the message for the takeaway message for the member states is fiscal consolidation first and the rest, well. Uh, 2015, number one on the annual growth survey is investment. Number two is structural reform, and that becomes even wider in terms of interpretation. And number three is fiscal responsibility, uh, which then is growth-friendly fiscal consolidation, whatever that means. But I think uh, Laszlo has explained that. Um, uh, okay, I, I'd just like to take a couple of um, comments here and also to respond to some of the statements uh, by others, and that is to go back to um, comments. I think I need to find my glasses. I can't read my writing. Um, yeah, um, I was focused on talking about legitimacy, so I didn't provide any of my own ideas about how we get beyond the problems, and I sort of take on board both of the comments, and especially uh, Laszlo was saying we need to rethink governance, and I think we do. And um, uh, one thing would be to change the economic policies, but good luck convincing Germans that order liberalism doesn't work for the rest of the EU. Um, but it occurred to me that what if, and actually I throw this out to the group, what if one changed one ideas of, of EU governance, EU... Um, uh, Eurozone governance to be something both uh, less hierarchical, more coordinated, and more s decentralized. So that at the EU level, the, the, the ECB would set a target, uh, a general target that might not just be 3% or that wouldn't necessarily just take into, in, take into account inflation, but also might take into account employment uh, prospects, etc., but that then, uh, from this general number, the Commission et al. would come up with specific targets for different countries, depending upon where they were in the economic cycle, whether they needed reflation, whether they needed to damp down inflation or whatever, so that you would have at the EU level, and then the Council, the European Parliament would discuss what would be the right uh, targets for each of the member states. And then the European semester might deal with that, but not in a hierarchical top-down fashion, but rather more bottom-up. How do the member states, given their very different varieties of, of, of capitalism and their different growth models, would be able to come up with uh, a way out? So it would be as if you take the proposed competitiveness councils and turn them into, dare I say the word, industrial policy councils. Uh, as a way of thinking about how you can individualize for each of the countries ways in which they could find growth that wouldn't be just the sort of the one size fits all. <clears throat> so that's on, that's on that, but just one other comment then. Um, on Mario's suggestion about having strengthening a hard core, having a Eurozone parliament, etc. I think that, uh, Yes, you can do that for the Eurozone, but it's a danger to think about that as the answer for Europe, that there would be a, a hardcore solely focused around the Eurozone. I tend to think about the EU in the future as more different policy communities with different, mem different clusters of member states overlapping in such a way that you end up with a soft core of member states because the Eurozone is only one of the policy areas. And once that gets fixed, hopefully somehow, once that gets fixed, then we have to think about all the other crises and all the other kinds of policy communities that need to be strengthened. They may net, that may also need their own budgets. What about common uh, security and defense policy? That requires major efforts, and it would be a policy community that would benefit by having the UK in, if you get a different kind of UK. 
obviously. Um, but it would, and, and you think about energy community or environment, you know, you think about all these areas where you have different European member states who could act as leaders with two or three. So that although I admit that there needs to be deepening in the Eurozone, that should not be to the detriment of other possible communities. And, and, and this may be simply at the level of discourse, but if we keep talking about hardcore uh, focused around the Eurozone and concentric circles, you alienate not just the UK, but also Sweden, Denmark, uh, Hungary. and Hungary, and perhaps other Central and European countries. And so it seems to me that the danger is you end up with more fragmentation uh, rather than integration. So yes, I mean, I sort of, I take the point about deepening uh, and creating a hardcore um, uh, Eurozone, but make other hard cores as well, so that you end up with a soft core across a wider range of policy communities. And I know I've talked too long, so can't answer the other questions, but we can do that individually. Uh, yeah, I think we're going to. Uh, yeah, what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to call it uh, the formal the formal session at uh, seven ten. Uh, because we started 10 minutes later, and then we can have some more informal. Uh, please, Nasi. OK, thank you much. Um, first of all, um, the euro is defined as the currency of the European Union. It's not the currency of the eurozone. The eurozone has been widening, and it continues to uh, widen. The eurozone is not a legal entity. The economic and monetary union is um, a legal uh, entity, so uh, to separate uh, the countries which are momentarily using the euro as a national currency would be an enormous uh, uh, legal and political uh, uh, controversy which we need to avoid. Uh, since the euro is the currency of the European Union, the European Parliament is uh, uh, the Parliament of the European Union, they have full competence. The fact that two countries have an opt-out from the third phase of the monetary union is a detail. Um, otherwise, I think we should uh, try to uh, 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 you know, safeguard uh, the integrity of the system. And this, by the way, is also in the mandate of the European Central Bank. Um, I would not agree with those who said that the ECB was stretching its mandate. Uh, yes, they have an excessive focus on price stability. They have no written mandate to focus on uh, employment, contrary to the Federal Reserve. Um, but uh, they have a responsibility to safeguard the integrity of the euro. And as compared to that, they have been too austere, uh, too um, <coughs> hesitant. I think it's too bad if you don't know that monetary policy can also uh, be too austere. Um, uh, just like fiscal, it can have expansion and restriction. It can be too tight and too relaxed. Um, and since the European Central Bank, um, before Draghi, was also too much biased um, for um, uh, mirroring the Bundesbank, which was the model of the surplus countries only, and not the average uh, uh, of, of the Eurozone. That was bad economic policy, which was represented by the European Central Bank. So they are also uh, uh, re uh, uh, an institution which represented um, untimely measures for consolidation, uh, a totally miscalculated exit policy from the crisis in 2010 and 11. So if you deny that, that's too bad. Um, we don't have a fair uh, uh, analysis of, um, of, 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 of uh, uh, this period. In, in, in that case, if you want to whitewash um, uh, Trichet and, um, and, and, and his colleagues. Now, the other whitewash, in my view, is just to forget about the EPP. I don't know if you know what the EPP is, but in 2010 and 11 and 12, the EPP was running Europe. Almost all prime ministers were EPP. And the economic doctrine of the EPP was actually uh, leading Europe into the second recession. It's not true that the austerity policy was not democratic, because the EPP politicians were elected. They were elected with the messages uh, which packaged the austerity policy. Um, there were one or two social democrats at the time. So it's not, you know, transition from Barroso to Juncker. I think this is insignificant in this context. The significant thing is that in 2010 and 11, it all shifted to EPP, 
And since 12, well, from 11, because Denmark started, but it, it was not so significant as France uh, in spring, it started to go to the other direction, and now there is a different composition of the European uh, 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 Council, and that's why the focus of the, the economic policy also has changed. So I, I, I would warn against uh, you know, falling for these smoke and mirrors about the AAA and all this uh, uh, kind of marketing uh, uh, exercise, which um, uh, was also referred to in this um, uh, discussion, whether you say first growth or jobs. Um, look, in 2012, the European Union was facing an existential crisis. It's, also, it's almost disintegrated. If Mario Draghi doesn't announce uh, what he announced in the summer of 2012, uh, we would not have the euro uh, anymore. We would not be speaking about this uh, anymore. And Draghi had to announce um, in July because the European Council failed even in 2012 June by not helping out Italy and Spain when Spain was also already also uh, going uh, down. Uh, so this, I'm, I believe, needs to uh, be taken uh, seriously. And the political uh, uh, direction, I appreciate it. That's why, of course, it's ridiculous if Wolfgang Schäuble or anyone else says that the ECB is responsible for uh, the AFD. The point is that the, the political base for the status quo has shrunk. It's not because of the ECB. Um, it's because um, in 2009, 10, 11, um, too many mistakes were made. If the German government, I'm sorry, had not waited for six months since the first news about the Greek crisis until May, and even the stupid elections in North Rhine-Westphalia we're holding back uh, the bailout of Greece. Is it not ridiculous? I'm sorry. Uh, and that only was driving up the price. It was just increasing the necessary amount through which Greece had to be bailed out. Uh, so who was holding back uh, this? It was perhaps also the ECB, but primarily it was the Chancellery in uh, Berlin. So all these mistakes, and Deauville, and all the rest of it. And so let's you know, um, take stock at some point of uh, what mistakes were made. And if this system cannot be run by people who are not sufficiently educated in economics, because people say that in uh, the finance ministry of Germany there are very few literate economists. Uh, there, might be, there might be many excellent lawyers. <laughs> Uh, but not macroeconomics, who would understand that the Eurozone is a macroeconomic uh, uh, system. Um, in that case, we need a different monetary union, which can be protected from the human factor. <laughs> as simple as that. Otherwise, the, the, the political base for sustaining the monetary union will continue to shrink. And either the AFD or the Five Star Movement or Marine Le Pen will just dismantle uh, this system sooner or later. So the political support is evaporating if it goes on uh, uh, like this. Uh, the, the governability of the Southern European countries is at stake. It's whatever Southern European country you're looking at, um, it's not a bright uh, picture. Uh, so, if we don't find a solution relatively quickly, um, uh, I think it will be too late. Uh, by the way, there was also just the last we, we question because there was a big misunderstanding here. I was not praising the IMF, I was praising the United States, uh, which either directly or indirectly was encouraging the Europeans to get their act together. And uh, of course, the US is, as we know, the major shareholder in the IMF. Um, and the World Bank. They were also using uh, the IMF uh, occasionally for, for, for delivering uh, this message and take a, a, a more complete responsibility for, uh, for, for yes, look, we the We have situation. to give Mario the possibility also to respond, and then we can continue. Uh, <laughs>
Okay, thank you uh, for the questions. I learned a lot, and thank you also. I think uh, we we have to address uh, research uh, question and research avenues uh, rather than providing answer. But uh, one question uh, uh, deserves uh, a very uh, committed answer. Your one, Athanasius. I take your question in particular because the question of uh, the role of the European Central Bank. Uh, has been also mentioned by indirectly by others. Well, in my opinion, since the beginning, the project of the European Monetary Union has been a political project. Since the beginning. On the, on the other hand, the Bundesbank tried to, to uh, uh, condition the, the way the, Euro, the European Central Bank has been created and the legal side. But since the Werner Plan in 71, the, the, the idea of a European currency is a political project. It's not based on the rational theory of an optimal uh, currency area. That has never been taken into consideration. It's the idea to, uh, to have a, a kind of symbol and driving factor for the political independence of Europe. And this idea has been revived on 18 July 2015 by the crucial decision taken in occasion of the Greek uh, crisis where uh, the European uh, Council was divided in two groups. On the one hand, Schäuble, mentioned by you, proposing Grexit, which a detailed proposal of Grexit. On the other hand, the others, including Merkel, supported by Hollande and Renzi, saying that we want to keep Greece in for political reason, because Putin will enjoy of the Greek exit, because of the eurosceptical trends will enjoy of the Greek exit. And so no, this was for financial reason. Greek, Greece, according to many, should uh, exit the Eurozone because uh, it's uh, very difficult to consolidate the, the debt. I, I am very happy that now the question is uh, how to restructure the debt of Greece in these very days. <laughs> However, uh, the, the financial difficulties were so big that only for political reasons Greece had been kept in. That is clear and was a political decision by Angela Merkel by the European Council after many, many days of discussion, many European Council. That is very important because, of course, there is the legal context. Of course, we are at the border of the legal context. However, it's possible, uh, since uh, the, the objective mentioned by Laszlo is to keep uh, the stability of the Eurozone, uh, that is, is, a, is a political concept, and that is, justifies, in my opinion, this decision. And that has to do also with the second question which has been addressed, whether the idea of concentric circle based not on the Eurozone, you are right, on the European Monetary Union membership, is a good idea or not? Or whether it is unfit for other policies, <coughs> policy community. But in my opinion, the, to mobilize the argument of other policy challenges strengthen the need of the hardcore. To be consulted, of course, with excellent relations with the others members of the European Union. However, if you look at the foreign policy, what can be done in Europe without strengthening the European, um, the European uh, uh, common foreign policy, common foreign security policy at level of the uh, European Monetary Union? We cannot be schizophrenic and saying that Germany is leader in uh, economic terms and they should be marginal in foreign policy. The alternative idea was the idea of an Anglo-French leadership in Saint-Malo by uh, Chirac and Tony Blair. Totally failed. Someone would like to propose this idea again. And uh, again, the, the, the last performance was uh, Libya in 2011 was a disaster. So, uh, we hope that uh, the new, the, the coming intervention in Libya in 2016 or 2017 will be based on, on the common foreign security policy that is on 
German-French leadership is a projection, is international projection of the European Monetary Union. This is the only political possible driver, a political leadership of the European Union, of course, including the willing, the willing are the members of the Eurozone or the next willing. And regarding the refugee crisis, after the failure of the quota redistributing to, to many countries, including Hungary and Poland, what is the alternative? If we want to have a true solidarity in the European Union, true solidarity, we, we have to, to image only at level of a small group of states to have that, Germany and others. And not, this is the only way not to isolate Germany as a kind of German Sonderweg. Uh, this happens to some extent because mm. Portugal, Belgium, France is are ready to welcome some of the refugees. Not only one more million for Germany would, would be unacceptable. But the other, what about the others? The others could be called in terms of uh, financial solidarity because they are not ready to, uh, to provide a practical solidarity in terms of welcoming refugees, and the refugees dislike to go to countries where they are not welcome, of course. And the, the only way is this way. So in my opinion, the other policy communities confirm the need of the Eurozone, not Eurozone, European Monetary Union consolidation as the big political driver. If we don't have this evolution, we, will, we risk a victory of the Eurosceptic tendencies, and the Eurosceptic tendencies are, are not a kind of sociological phenomenon of uh, like uh, uh, democratic splitting. Is, there is a political trend toward authoritarian temptation. I underline that the stake is political. It's not a kind of sociological uh, evolution of the European uh, uh, consensus and deficit, a democratic deficit. That is, uh, under, would be underestimating how serious the European crisis of today is. We are really at the turning point in the European crisis. And that is, uh, we have to focus on the very issue. The very issue is political. We need to, to offer a new combination of the problem addressed by Montesquieu 270 years ago. And, uh, the solution at that time was the United States of America, but we are unable to, co to create the United States of Europe. We have to combine in different ways the two challenges of Montesquieu. On the one hand, the representation of people. On the other hand, we need international power. Without international power, Europe plus foreign policy, we have nothing, and the European project is condemned. Thank you very much. Okay, guys.